Okay, we are recording. That's close enough to 11.45. We'll get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank your interest. Thank you for your interest in supporting our native wildlife. Uh, this presentation is being made possible through a collaborative effort between South Florida Association of Environmental Professionals and UF IFAS, who is providing this facility for us. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, all the audio from this room will be picked up, as well as any comments made from people on the webinar. Um, Uh, if you're here in the building, you need to use the restrooms right outside to the left. You're allowed to eat in here, but if you do eat, make sure you clean up everything you bring in, please. Um, a little bit about South Florida Association of Environmental Professionals. If you want to find out more about them, you can go to the website on www.sfap.org. Uh, we're an organization of um, environmental professionals for South Florida from Dade, Miami, I'm sorry, Miami Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, uh, Monroe counties. We have regular events like this where we disseminate information about the environmental profession and we get together regularly for other events. We have adopted islands in Biscayne Bay, the Sandspur Islands. We go out there quarterly for cleanups. Uh, we have also um, are establishing a onshore coral nursery so our members can do research on corals and then we'll be using the corals to outplant um, in the wild. And we have started a community oyster garden. Uh, first Culch Bag has been deployed in Dania Cutoff Canal, and we're hoping that succeeds to replace some of the last oyster beds here in Broward County. Uh, next year, the National Association of Environmental Professionals is having their annual conference here in Broward County. Uh, we hope to have a tract on this subject of you know, importance of native wildlife to native Importance of native vegetation to native wildlife. We'll have to see how much interest there is, but hopefully that will happen to continue with the efforts we've been um, investing in today. Anyways, um, a little bit about myself, and then we'll have the panelists introduce themselves. I am um, the Environmental Program Manager at Port Everglades, which is the Broward County Department. I have a bachelor's in zoology, a master's in marine biology, focusing on fish and wildlife. I'm also a certified arborist, certified ecologist, certified fisheries professional, certified wildlife biologist, and professional wetland scientist. I really enjoy this stuff, and that's one of the reasons we um, are having this meeting today. I'm very passionate about the importance of our native vegetation to protect our native wildlife. And uh, let's go through the panelists. Um, Mark, are you available to unmute and introduce yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mark Hostetler. I'm a professor in the Department of Wildlife, Ecology, and Conservation at the University of Florida, currently up in Gainesville. Um, I'm an urban ecologist for over 20 years now. I've been working with a number of decision makers, collaborators on how we can design and manage cities to conserve biodiversity and wildlife habitat. Okay, and Richard? Uh, I'm Richard Brownscombe, and I'm president of the Broward Chapter of the Society. And we have speakers and field trips uh, each month, except for this one. And uh, we uh, take a responsibility to look after the natural areas in the county of Broward. Okay. Jimmy? And I'm Jimmy Lang. I'm the, the lead botanist with the South Florida Conservation Program from Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. Um, I, I mainly focus on mapping and monitoring and guiding management activities for rare plant species uh, around South Florida and parts of the Caribbean. Um, and I've recently started working with Broward County on a, on a contract with the county, so I've been kind of inventorying and, and mapping rare plants and trying to design conservation projects uh, for the next couple years here. I'm also here today as the, the chair of the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, um, and I'll be talking a little bit about the missions of, of FLEPSI today. Hi, I'm Courtney Angelo. Um, I'm with Broward County Parks and Recreation. I um, have a PhD in botany with an emphasis in ecology and conservation biology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm a botanist and an invasive species biologist. I've been working in this field um, for about 15 years. 
Carolyn, can you unmute? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Mitchell. I'm with WSP, and I'm a landscape architect. I have a bachelor's in botany and a master's in landscape architecture, and I've been practicing landscape architecture for close to 30 years and focusing on conservation, environmental restoration, and also integrating natural systems into urban environments. Very good. And Cammie? Cammie Donaldson. I uh, have been active in Florida's native plant movement for over 30 years, um, the last 25 of which I have devoted to trying to grow the native plant industry in Florida. I'm the executive director of the Florida Association of Native Nurseries and the Native Plant Horticulture Foundation. My name is Mina Angelotti. I work with Naturescape Broward in the Environmental Planning and Community Resilience Division. Um, prior to working here, I worked as a wildlife ecologist with the Bureau of Land Management in Jackson, Mississippi, and with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm a graduate of UMass Amherst and UF. Okay, Mark, you're up next. All right. Well, good. It's, it's fun to, to see a little screen and hear the voices in the background. Um, I assume Eric will have a chance later on to discuss some things. So I'll just launch into my um, kind of spiel for the next 10 minutes. Is that correct, Eric? 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. So to give you a little more background, um, I, I was thinking about what to present today. And uh, a lot, sometimes ecology is translated into the design professional world as large patches uh, connected by corridors, which is important for a lot of species. I mean, when you think of panthers and bears and some larger species that need these large patches and even a few birds. But what I think gets lost in the translation is that uh, even fragmented areas, urban matrices, uh, rural um, areas with um, some native vegetation and some human-dominated landscapes can provide a wide variety of habitat for a wide variety of species. And so I'm not going to talk so much, uh, with the caveat being these little fragments of uh, remnants that are left in the landscape as being important. Natives contribute a whole lot to this, and, and I'm not going to touch on that. I'm going to leave that to the other presenters. But what I am going to talk about is a new um, synthesis and new tool that we designed just for this occasion for birds, and we're talking about forest birds here. And so a graduate student, uh, Yan and I, a couple years ago, scoured the literature with the idea of saying, okay, which birds are out there across North America that use fragments in and around cities in rural areas, uh, whether they breed there and and also importantly, whether they use it as stopover habitat. There was no synthesis of this type, and this was our first attempt to really kind of uh, get a list of species that use uh, fragmented areas and even uh, residential areas with tree canopy cover. So once we had done this, I'll, I'll give you a little more information about what we did, is we created an online evaluation tool. And the idea here is for landscape architects, for planners, for decision makers. Um, if cities are expanding or if they want to retrofit areas, um, how do different designs impact uh, different species? So that slide that you're looking at right now, if you had, uh, let's say, a few acres to conserve or to restore, if you did it in small bits, such as little five acres, or you did one large one, a 15 acre or more, and, and did it in some smaller uh, five acre plots. Which species are you impacting, and uh, how could you improve the habitat for, say, resident species that occur year round or migrants? So if you click to the next slide. So this is uh, this tool is online. Um, the URL is a little long. I know at the top, but if you just uh, Google "building for birds" and um, UF IFAS, I will take you there. And the whole idea of this tool is to uh, all that information that um, 
uh, we synthesize is presented in the fashion that uh, people can do kind of like on the back of a paper napkin, uh, uh, some analysis to see how design impacts different species. So that's the URL. Uh, I would appreciate feedback from folks if uh, they do use it. Uh, we're trying to see how it fits in with planning the design of cities and around cities. Okay, go ahead, Eric. So when we first started doing this, we, we started uh, uh, very complicated. As an ecologist, I got into the, <laughs> the weeds pretty quickly here. But luckily, we had on our team some designers and planners that said, no, we need really simple inputs uh, with simple metrics. And so what was the inputs is two things. Uh, if you're looking at a human-dominated uh, landscape and, and you're trying to think how you're going to design it, you just enter the patches, what we call conserved late and early successional forests. And late, conserved, uh, late successional forests, essentially, if you walk and you see canopy above you, uh, early successional, you don't see that canopy. Uh, think woodpeckers versus aquifers in this type of habitat. So that's one input is the patch sizes, and the second input there, if you can click, is just tree canopy cover in the built area. So uh, if you're thinking residential or commercial, uh, it takes a lot to conserve the trees in there, um, but it does have an important impact for. Uh, bird habitat, and when I talk about bird habitat today, there's also a whole suite of other species you can think in terms of insects and, and smaller critters um, that can traverse these landscapes or live in individual patches. All right, go ahead and click. So there's five steps to this. Um, the tool is one to uh, register the site that you're looking at. Maybe it's a 100-acre plot or a 50-acre plot. Uh, and then you will enter how much is going to be conserved with one design versus another, and then you'll get scores based on um, what we call stopover habitat, uh, migrants that are passing through the area or um, during the spring and fall migration, and then also you get uh, scores for breeding habitat. So if you uh, click on the next slide, And these scores um, will give you kind of like a range from, you know, very little habitat to a lot of habitat. And you can imagine, I didn't have time to go into detail about this, but you can imagine how those scores will shift depending on what patches of habitat are conserved. And what we found is that there's a, over 200 species, and I, I suspect much more because um, there's a lot of literature, empirical research that's missing particularly out west, um, of birds that use some fashion. So whether they're using it as a stopover site or as a breeding site, uh, we broke down the bird list that accompanies your habitat scores that you can get from this online tool. So if you focus your attention on the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, well, it gets checks all across the board. Uh, it breeds in the forest fragment. It uses it uh, during a migration. Um, and it actually breeds in residential areas and as a stopover in residential areas. And this is all from empirical research. And of course, anecdotally, people know that ruby throat is during the uh, quite often. But let's look at some of the more problematic species, like the black and white warbler. This is a neotropical migrant. Um, it travels long distances. It does not breed in Florida. It breeds uh, what we call an interior forest specialist. And so the empirical research demonstrated, yeah, this is not going to do too well in the forest fragment. It needs a larger continuous uh, patch of forest. However, during migration season, um, if there are any birders in the audience, you know during the fall or spring, you can see these birds uh, migrating north or, or migrating south, and you can find them in small fragments. So you can provide critical stopover habitat for these migrants in and around cities. And if you look at the far right there, it says stopover in residential areas. It has a question mark. And the reason we did this is that we were conservative with the study. It is now published in Landscape and Urban Planning. You can get the synthesis. If anybody's interested, I can give you a copy of the paper. Um, and in the residential areas, uh, we found one or two papers 
but not three that indicated that black and white warbler uses residential areas of a tree canopy as stopover sites. So we just put a question mark there. If you look at the yellow warbler down there, um, this bird list, you can imagine this is, this is a section of 215 birds, all uh, forest birds. We didn't do the large raptors, but all passerines, woodpeckers, and other family. Um, you can see a blank there. That means there was no uh, literature on the yellow warbler, um, whether it breeds in forest fragments or breeds in residential areas. However, we did find them in stopover papers, and they do um, use forest fragments as stopover areas. Again, a question mark for the residential area. Uh, again, uh, this is we're just being conservative, but there's some indication that even this species will also use um, residential areas with trees as stopover habitat. And I can't emphasize more sort of that message that we have to think beyond uh, large patches and corridors and think about the human dominated systems and how there's a, quite a variety of species that use this for breeding or for migrating or for wintering. And in particular, there's more and more research that's um, coming out. And recently I just read an article about how during climate change, these urban, rural, human-dominated systems, if uh, they provide enough structure and habitat, they can pr promote movement of animals across the landscape. They might not breed in the area, but they give enough connectivity to move animals as climate change and, and, and habitats are changing. So if you want to go to the last slide, I think. So I know uh, uh, I, I kept it uh, short. Uh, the only caveat is, yeah, fragments are important. Tree canopy cover is important, important. But there is research out there. If anybody's interested, I can give you the reports about how natives promote um, a better bird habitat and wildlife habitat um, for our native species. So uh, we, not every fragment is equal. And then also you can think in terms of management of the matrix around these fragments. And there's a lot of impact from inputs in the yard, what people decide to plant, how it escapes into uh, the fragmented areas. So my, I guess my other take home message besides that fragments matter is that the matrix matters that surrounds these habitats. You can provide more habitat within residential areas for these birds and, and in fact, I have a, a graduate student looking at this right now, how the birds move out of these forest fragments and forage in residential areas. But also you can think in terms of minimizing impacts. So uh, if invasives are in the yards, they will spread into the forest, nearby forested areas. Or, or if you put too much fertilizer or, ir or irrigate too much, all those nutrients can go into nearby riparian areas or wetland areas. Um, if you want more information uh, about this, I can. Uh, I have. I didn't have time to talk about that. Uh, this one um, uh, course man. It's a. It's a design manual for cities and for landscape arch architects and developers about how you can serve biodiversity during subdivision development. Uh, I can send that to you. Uh, there's my email, and I think I'm right at 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, we have Richard. Uh, I'm just going to use a broad brush to try to describe the uh, past and current status of native plants in Broward County. After World War II, Broward had uh, about 730 recorded native plant species. Today we have about 620. Uh, local extinction is at about 15%. Uh, only recently, cooperation between Broward County's environmental program, the Institute for Regional Conservation, and um, Bear Trail Tropical Botanic Gardens refocused on identifying rare plants in Broward and their locations. Uh, the bad news is the speed of local extinction. It's mostly due to habitat loss and uh, the smothering by invasive species. Uh, our native species now live on small or relatively small properties, often with fundamental hydrologic changes, drainage. 
the good news is that this effort to identify rare species is finding species that we never knew we had in Broward, and that's very, very exciting and helpful. And the big picture is interesting and not especially intuitive. So um, I think before this slide, before, yep. Uh, that uh, 200 native species out of that roughly 700 uh, live in the Everglades management areas, all those uh, uh, hundreds uh, of square acres out there. 500 live in the, on the coastal berm there in the populated area, uh, in our natural parks and preserves. So that means our natural parks and preserves that sometimes look like overgrown lots or pockets of trees behind chain link fences contain our legacy of critically imperiled, rare, and endangered species. Almost inevitably, you live and work near some of these places. There are unusual and fascinating plants and wildlife there. They contain the last populations of species in Broward. Every natural area is important and different. I have referred to them as the outdoor rooms of a uh, living natural history museum. They are not yet known for their importance or properly respected. You can see why from this historical map, the next one. Um, the Coral Ridge, uh, where we uh, build, because generally speaking, it's higher and drier. Uh, and that's where the habitat diversity uh, was greatest. And you can see the percentages remaining. There are a couple pointed out there with the red arrows uh, that we ignored all the living species except ourselves, a behavior that has to change if they and we are to survive. Uh, today, only 3.3% is left on the, of the coral uh, ridge. I'm, uh, coastal ridge is what I'm trying to say. Uh, these are the natural areas that hold our native plant and wildlife legacy. Right here, within our densely populated area, behind the warehouses and in residential neighborhoods. Because the land for nature is now so limited, restoration and native landscaping are important. Just in terms of food supply for indigenous and migrating birds, for example, there isn't enough native source food. Why is native food important? Native plants are the nutritional foundation, the chemistry for living and growing wildlife. It's housing, natural areas are space, and privacy for shy wildlife. Broward has been above sea level for perhaps 80,000 years, with slowly changing climate over thousands and tens of thousands of years, and slowly changing habitat. Coevolution over long periods of time creates interactions between plants and plants, animals and animals, plants and animals. Prey, predator, symbiosis, mutualism become highly complex and sometimes highly specific. The public has some understanding of plant-specific butterfly hosts. Birds, too, may require specific insects for the necessary nutrition for young. All these interactions are highly complex, happening a million times over in an ecosystem and a habitat, and it's happening with micro microbial interactions, too. It's also poorly studied, certainly here in Broward and here in urban Broward, where the action is, we are the human species. So we, the human species, need to do what does not come easily to us and be humble about what we know and what we do. I advocate using science, but in the absence of information about natural areas in urban Broward, we also need to use common sense. And here are five things I recommend. Just plant natives. Plants are food supply. Don't fuss the public about what and how. Just applaud when native plants are used. 
Restoration is different. Be more careful about species and local source material for restoration work. Education and sophistication is good, and it takes time. For the public, just plant natives. Number two, use diversity. Because of ecological complexity, plant a diversity of species. Variety is where all the interest is, and what's unusual or ignored is likely to be helpful and perhaps essential for all we know. Plant a diversity of native species. Number three, finding specific species or a diversity of native species is hard. Okay, so it's hard. Finding rare baseball cards is hard too. Just do it, it's worthwhile. Take what's available, that's easy. Or be persistent. It is a public service when you start creating a demand for diverse species. Number four, native nurseries are like craft breweries. Everything good about them is local. They can locally source plants and may find what you need. They are quirky. They are all natural and organic. Big boxes can't do that, source locally. If you support local nurseries as much as local breweries, they too will one day collectively outsell the big boys by local. Number five, know what is locally native. Restoration work and grade A landscaping can find species native to a site by using the Institute for Regional Conservation, regionalconservation.org. It is comprehensive, about 1,500 South Florida native species, and more accurate and more specific about plant range for South Florida than the USF Atlas for Vascular Plants. And it has a subset database called Natives for Your Neighborhood <laughs> with cultivation information for over 400 species. It also has our natural areas and exactly the plants that are in them. Uh, email me for help. Go to kunti.org uh, for my email, for a list of native nurseries, for a recent article about the local extinction crisis in Broward. Kunti.org. Our behavior, let's see, you can go on. There's some of the endemic species. There are, of course, many more. <coughs> Next slide. Oh, my. <laughs> Plant and animal interactions. Next slide. There's the article. Next slide. There we go. Our behavior <laughs> that has, has to change if we and other species are to survive. We are wonderful, even beautiful. Don't hate yourself or your species, but we have to change this thing about us that we don't love other species as much as we love ourselves. Here is an image for that, Misty Copeland dancing harmlessly, beautifully, above a field of sunflowers. Create your own images, get the word out. Thanks, Richard, for that great introduction into Broward's flora. Um, I wanted to go through some of the challenges that we have in defining, obtaining, um, and identifying Broward's flora. So at a landscape cell, um, Broward County has some unique challenges determining which species are native to the county. There are more than 120 species with disjunct populations across the Tri-County area, so Palm Beach, Broward, Miami-Dade, with species in Broward County not being vouchered or uh, documented. In addition to those species, there are also species that have their northern limits terminate in Miami-Dade or their southern limits terminate in Palm Beach County. And all of these species combined make up Broward's dark diversity, or species that are absent from the county but are found in surrounding counties and have the potential to inhabit areas in Broward County. 
And as a land manager, I have to evaluate Broward stock diversity and determine if calling these species native is appropriate for the county. Next slide, please. So there are many explanations for why we see these patterns across our landscape. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, Richard spoke of the habitat loss that has occurred in Broward County. Only 3% of our natural areas um, still exist in eastern Broward County. You also have to look at um, the life cycle of a plant can be a contributing factor in why we see these patterns. Um, ephemeral species um, may not be detected in surveys. For instance, the sand dune spur, um, you can see on the ISB map, it is um, not vouchered for the county, but recently Jimmy Lang and I found it um, at Mizzle Johnson State Park. Um, but it's an annual species, so it might have just been overlooked in the past. Next slide, please. Other explanations could be that the species was extirpated before it was vouchered for the county. Um, we have historical accounts of the clamshell orchard being in the county, um, but we have recently gone out and looked for it and have not been able to find it to document it for the county. Um, species can also have rare um, populations and may not be detected unless you're specifically looking for them. And also, um, th it's pretty well known that um, there was a lack of exploration in Broward County um, during the early plant explorations in this area. A lot of explorers wanted to get down to um, Miami-Dade and Moreau counties to explore. And so Broward wasn't um, documented as much as those other counties. And also, um, there was also loss of bot botanical documentation, um, some of Leitner's um, vouchers were lost um, during his explorations. Next slide, please. So that's looking at a broad scale and the challenges um, that I go through trying to define native species in the landscape. But when we go into the marketplaces, there's also other challenges um, that we face. And in Broward County's park system, we are um, constantly installing new landscapes or creating gardens um, for the public's benefit, but also for the benefit of wildlife. And we are trying to create these landscapes based on plant communities found in the area. But when you go into the marketplace, um, there are challenges because sometimes non-native species look like native species or they're being sold as native species. Um, the firebush is a hot topic. Um, there's two varieties. There's a native variety and a non-native variety that look very similar. And a lot of times the non-native variety is sold as the native variety. Or even when you request it um, for a specific project, you are brought the non-native in lieu of um, the native. And this has been widely discussed, and yet there are still challenges with this when um, requesting this plant for native landscaping. Next slide, please. Um, another uh, native species that we have this issue with is the native um, porterweed. So there's um, a non-native in the same genus that is on the Flupsy list, and a lot, of, and there's also a hybrid of this of the native and non-native that are in the marketplace. And despite having different growth habits, um, the non-native a lot of times is sold as the native species, and because of this, um, we are currently not allowing the species to be. Um, planted in our park system. Next slide, please. And then there's also challenges identifying native species due to um, taxonomic changes. Um, so there's kind of a, a complex story going on with the Zamia. Um, so the scientific community has updated our native county as Zamia integrifolia, but still in the marketplace it is labeled as uh, Zamia pumila. Um, 
But beyond that challenge, you see, it would seem to um, you would seem to think that you could just like exchange the names. But Zamia Pumila is actually referred to um, as a complex, and there are many different species that were once represented by this one name. Um, and also, this species is highly associated with Native Americans and was moved around Florida and the Caribbean before modern um, accounts. So the genetic integrity of this species may have already been um, distorted and convoluted uh, before this name change. So I actually reached out to a researcher at um, the Montgomery Botanical Center down in Miami to ask him about this Zamia issue. And so um, the Zamia pumilla, the strictest sense or the purest form of this species is found in the Dominican Republic. And he didn't think that there was like a high chance that we would actually find this species um, in the nursery trade in Florida. Um, so an easy solution to this, this issue with identifying this species in the marketplace would be having an expert or a professional go into the marketplace using the morphological characteristics that define Zamia integrifolia, identify the individuals that reflect these, um, these traits, and then ask the nursery industry to update the name change. So that's a, a quick and easy solution for this species. Next slide, please. Um, another challenge um, that Richard also um, spoke about is obtaining these native species and um, issues with supply and demand and um, possibly issues with the availability of local seed resources. Um, so as I, as I said, we try to create landscapes that have native species that are diverse, that offer a wide range of ecosystem services for um, our park services. And with that, we want to have as many possibilities um, available to us as possible. And um, I also like quickly uh, went on the IRC's um, natives for your neighborhood uh, website and just kind of like scan to see oh how many um, natives are available to plant um, around my office which is in Oakland Park and there was a, a long list of natives that popped up potential natives for our area but when you go in and try to find these natives that same number is not reflected in the marketplace so I want to pose the question how do we create a greater demand for more natives in the marketplace and how do we support our native nursery so they can create this diversity that we are looking for that's it thank you and i'll give you a little air click when i need to advance the slide does that seem reasonable <laughs> okay so uh, i was actually going to start with the, i can start with the connect with tech um okay so my brilliant colleagues had a lot of great plant knowledge to share. Um, so I'm going to kind of focus on some of the programs that the organizations I'm a part of are working on. Um, first of which is Fairchild's Connect to Protect program. And I think this is something that can you kind know, of spark some of these conversations and, and is doing part of this job of creating demand, uh, particularly in Miami-Dade. Um, so the Connect to Protect network um, is basically a network of, of native gardeners. Um, we're trying to provide education and citizen science, and we're focusing in the Pine Rockland ecosystem of, of Miami-Dade. Next. I need to focus on that. <laughs> um, so the Pine Rocklands are a globally critically imperiled plant community with a single species overstory, um, very diverse uh, understory of herbaceous uh, plants and graminoids. Um, and so when, when folks come to Fairchild and they sign up for the Connect with Tech Network, um, we start them, and this can be, we can do private homeowners, get a starter kit and a sign, um, typically five plants. If you make a donation, they can get more plants. Um, and, and businesses and schools can get uh, up to 10 plants. Um, and they also then become part of the monthly e-newsletters, and they get, you know, these invitations to uh, participate in field trips and work days and, and other things that we do uh, as part of Fairchild. 
And so this is a map of the Pine Rockland ecosystem. We currently have 600 homes and 100 schools. And this is this number is slightly old, so it's probably um, a little bit more now. And here's just a map of what's left of the fragmented habitat. The big green blob in the middle um, are the, the Rocklands around Zoo Miami. And so here are, is a map of all of the homes and businesses. So you know we're trying to do this job of you know what Mark talked about establishing these um, stepping stone gardens and 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 corridors uh, throughout the urban landscape. Um, so our main goals are you know we want to promote pine rockland plants in the community. You know as I said we want to create this this connection through stepping stone gardens. But our main focus is educating residents about native diversity and getting people excited about it. Um, and some of this is a is a public relations battle. And so, maybe once more, yeah. So and so this is a battle against the steady supply of cheap non-native plants, the big box stores, monocultures, um, lawn chemical treadmills, as we call it. And so we want to show people that native plants can be beautiful. You know, we think diversity is beautiful. So th this is a picture taken in uh, Long Key at Everglades National Park, and few people would argue this is a beautiful landscape. But you know, how can we show the public that oh, you know, your your native yard can also be beautiful? So one of the ways we did that is we had a a photography contest of Connect to Protect Gardens, and these were some of the winners from 2018. Um, and, and these were shared online through social media. Um, and when people sign up, we show them this is you know these are. Some you know some examples of what your yard could look like, and so basically you know the current network because we're focused on the system uh, in Miami Dade, it's open to Miami Dade and Monroe County residents, um, and they all they have to do is kind of send us an email and they they stop by the nursery and pick up plants, and so it's just some of the key points of this program and I think what make it unique and special. Um, you know some of the concerns about about native plants and and getting more native plants into the system are kind of who's going to harvest them from the wild. So in the, in this case we have you know trained biologists from Fairchild who work closely with land managers who are going out and harvesting the seed, following uh, guidelines from the Center for Plant Conservation. Um, you know this ensures proper identification and and provenance of, of the plants, so you know what you're getting, you know where it's from. Um, and it prevents over harvesting. Um, but then following that, sharing is encouraged in, in our network. You know, once people have the plants in the community, we don't pretend to have any kind of ownership over them. We, we encourage people to share these plants and, and get them out there and get them around. Um, and our more passionate members, you know, when people are like, oh, we got this starter kit, we love it. How do we get more? You know, we refer them to native nurseries and we work with native nurseries in Miami Dade. And, um, you know, I think this is part of that. You know, get increasing demand that uh, that the program can provide. Um, also, one of the big things about it is it's free. You know, people are really into oh, the, I'll plant native if you'll give me free stuff. All I have to do is show up. Um, but that creates some of the issues of how do we increase this? So currently, this is this program is funded through money from Section Six of the Endangered Species Act that kind of gets channeled through the Florida Forest Service. And into the Department of Agriculture, and then to us for a rare plant conservation program. So this was kind of under the guise of, you know, this this was we're protecting a habitat that is home to many rare plants. So you know, through outreach and education, we're kind of indirectly, you know, conserving our plants. But it is indirect. So money from this grant system, we would love to spend it on actual work with rare plant species. Um, you know, so we're. Really focusing on how we can increase the, the scale of this of this project, and hopefully we can discuss some of these things today. Uh, I'm not, I'll skip the acknowledgments. There's a lot of great people. That, that's another aspect of Connect to Protect that's important is we have a lot of volunteers. Not a lot of organizations can necessarily pull this off. Fairchild has a huge volunteer base. Um, so I'll jump over to Plepsi and I'll try to do this quickly. Um, a lot of people don't know what Plepsi is. They know we're the people who make the list. We have category one and category two invasive species. Category one being the ones that have demonstrated, you know, to do ecological damage in our in our natural areas. Category two being things that seem to be spreading but maybe haven't caused that same degree of damage yet. Um, but beyond that, 
it, the vision of FLEPC is to be a leading resource and partner for advancing invasive plant management in Florida, and our mission is to reduce the impacts of invasive plants through the exchange of scientific, educational, and technical information. Um, so each year, so basically what I'm going to do for the next couple of minutes is just talk about how folks can, how FLEPC can perhaps help some of you in the room, but also how you can help FLEPC and the, you know, the fight against invasive plants. So each year we have an annual conference. Oh, sorry, not yet. <laughs> Each year we have an annual conference. Uh, it's in April next year. It's going to be in Daytona. Um, this is it's a great way to get CEUs. We have a lot of great speakers. This this year, this past April, was all about bridging the gaps um, between uh, invasive plant science and management. And, you know, so we're trying to connect people on the ground spraying invasive plants to you know people in universities doing the research. We also have a grant program for our CISMAs. Um, so these are cooperative invasive species management areas. Um, so each year we get a pool of applicants from each CISMA, and so we try to uh, fund work that they're doing. Uh, we have an education grant. These are, you know, these are usually small grants, but these are little things that can get a sign printed or you know, little things like that that hopefully can help spread the word about invasive plants. We also have a research grant um, where we fund one to two, depending on the applicants uh, each year. These are usually graduate students, sometimes undergrad, uh, where we help you know, pay for some of their, their research costs. Um, and this is an aspect that, that I worked this year on petitioning uh, six species for the state noxious weed list. And this is something that I wanted to bring up. Maybe not a lot of people know this. Anyone can do this through the Department of Agriculture website. If there's a, a species that you just think needs to be taken off the market and you have good reason and good data to back it up, you can go on the Department of Agriculture website and petition to get these species listed and taken off, taken off the market. So, I mean, this can be a very important step that literally anyone can make, but not a lot of people know uh, the way to do it to go about it. But, you know, there's on the Department of Agriculture website, if you go to the Noxious Weed page, there it'll kind of guide you step by step through the process. Um, Flepsy also does a lot of outreach. I won't focus on that so much. Um, and then you know the plant list. Each year we added we added two new species this past year and kind of in, increased one from category two to category one. Um, but this is another thing that I think folks don't understand necessarily the process. It kind of happens behind closed doors. But this is a process that we want to make very transparent and we want everyone in the community to be involved in. Everyone in FLEPC are kind of volunteers doing this in their spare time. Um, so also on the FLEPC webpage, you can submit criteria sheets. You know, so a lot of people will have an invasive plant. They're like, oh, it's not listed yet. Why not? Perhaps folks in FLEPC don't know about it or just no one's had the time to put together a sheet. Um, so you can go on the FLEPC webpage. And again, there will be a sheet step-by-step -step process of how you can get uh, a plant proposed to where the plant list committee can then review it and, and get that plant added to the list. And that's, that's it for me. Thanks. OK, well, wonderful. First, I just want to say a big thank you to Courtney and Jimmy and Richard. Uh, everything you said about supporting our nurseries, we really appreciate it. Uh, we love you and thank you for the great work that you're doing. Um, I was asked to address three questions. The first question was, um, what are the challenges that a commercial grower faces in, in producing native plants? Um, and the very first challenge is simply knowledge of the product. And I think we've heard a lot today about the complexities of knowing what's native and what's not, and where it's native and what it does. And plant ID, while there are many plants that are very easy to identify at a glance, there are also many which are quite tricky to identify. And that knowledge is not um, not a typical part of the the educational background of many commercial growers, although in the native plant industry we try to pride ourselves on having folks that uh, very often do have a stronger biological or ecological background and uh, pay attention to plant ID. But throughout the horticulture industry, there is a great need for, I, I say this all the time, I wish that horticulturists would give more attention and have more opportunity to ingest 
ecological knowledge. And on the ecology side, we need to perhaps grant a little bit of respect to the role of horticulture in the production and sale of plants in a world of humans who care about what things look like and are less informed about what things do. What is important about native plants? Yes, it's important that they be beautiful, and many of them are, and we don't actually understand how to see that yet. But what's most important is what they do. Nothing is more important for preserving wildlife than providing habitat, and habitat demands native plants. So knowledge of the product, education of the industry is, is very important, and our association focuses on that. Uh, and we are in our infancy. The native plant industry in Florida is less than 50 years old as any kind of organized entity. And in fact, believe it or not, we're actually ahead of the rest of the country in some respects in that regard. Um, I tell people all the time, I loved Richard's, I love his reference to the craft breweries. I like that. Um, I often tell people, think of organic and healthy and local food and where that was in the 60s. People started to be interested in health and environment and, and started to really push it. But I know when I got out of college, we had a little local community co-op where you could go to the cafe and you know get a healthy local organic thing, and it was really kind of horrible. You know, we ate it because it was good for us and it was good for the cause, but it was a pile of brown rice and steamed veggies and soy sauce, and it just wasn't appetizing. Um, and think how that has changed. Now you can go into any grocery store, and there's an enormous selection of things, and some of them are really at very attractive. Some of them are very expensive. Some are not. There's, you know, some are things are really good. Some are not. There's a lot more out there. Uh, that all came through organized, repetitive, repetitive, you know, persistent, passionate campaigns for education and awareness, both within the food industry and for the public. And the same has to be done for our horticulture industry. Getting seeds and plants, oh my goodness, such a difficult thing. And of course, in the horticulture industry, guess what? Most plants are not produced from seed, not on the big scale. Most of them are from cuttings, you know. Uh, getting seed is very, very difficult. Where are you going to get that seed? Not out of a state park, maybe out of a national park maybe out of a county park. How much are you going to get? Who's going to identify it? Thank goodness Fairchild's got biologists involved in their seed collection, and that's exactly what we need. Um, but it's difficult. Where are you going to get that seed? How are you going to maintain genetic diversity over time in the nursery, where a typical practice is to have these mother plants that are producing things? You know, Well, over time, you need to change that up to keep the diversity going. Um, then the whole idea of provenance, um, our folks joke about the 50 miler club. As a customer, you want this plant to have come from seed that was responsibly sourced within 50 miles of, you know, where you're using it. Well, no one is set up in the industry to track that. And the food industry is struggling with that right now. Even the marijuana folks, who are the only people that have enough money to deal with this, um, <laughs> are struggling with provenance of their buds or whatever it is. Um, but to, to scale, to have an operation, be able to say, this is where the seed came from, and this is the liner starter plant that it produced, and this was stepped up to a one gallon, and that was stepped up to a three gallon, and that was grown into, and it was shipped over here. It would take years to develop that. Not that we shouldn't have that, but it's, it's enormous. The requirement in time and staff and dollars and infrastructure to do that is enormous. And only large operations would be able to begin to do that today. And large operations will not respond until the demand is there. And the small little local nurseries that Richard referred to that you should cultivate can do that on a small scale, but then they can't scale up supply beyond the individual's yard. So there's all those 
difficulties. And many people are not aware that in the horticulture industry, it's it's like <laughs> other aspects. Um, there's a chain. You almost typically there's a chain of people involved. It's very rare, except at the smallest scale for the person who is selling you the plant to be the same person who collected the seed and grew it up from the seed to the finished plant. You know, if you're if you're growing trees or shrubs or other things, there have been many people involved, many different companies all along the way. Even within the native plant industry in Florida, we have people that buy starter plants and seed from other states and then grow them up and then ship them out again. A plant could have been all the plant could be much better traveled than you by the time it gets to where it's installed. Um, impacts on the supply, I mean, yes, there's the issue of weather, like hurricanes, Eric asked about. And of course, that's been very recent with Irma, has been very disruptive, but that's true with any agricultural entity. Climate change, we have no idea what that's going to throw our way, but we have certainly already been observing it. Growers in Florida's native plant industry have steadily observed how plants, particularly along the coast, are climbing up and the changes. And it's affecting rainfall, which in a lot of our smaller operations, which are not greenhouses, that's a big deal. Um, the economy for horticulture is probably for ornamental plant horticulture, the economy maybe is the biggest thing. We're the last product to go in the ground. This is true whether it's native or not. If you're developing, boy, there's a need for everything, but the plants are the last thing that's needed, and when the budget goes bust, that's it. And when the economy crashes, we're the first thing to get cut, too. So, you know, everybody's already talking about, ooh, 2021, what's going to be? Let's sell all the plants we can now, grow like crazy, you know? I mean, when the had the big financial crisis in 2008, Ooh, that cleaned out the nursery industry in Florida. Huge numbers of nurseries disappeared. We grow a perishable product. We can't keep it sitting there until you're ready to plant it. All of those issues, you know, you, you can't afford to keep stepping up. I, I've talked to people who are horrified to find out that growers burn trees that can't be sold because they can't afford to do otherwise. It is horrible. But these are, these are, those are impacts on supply, much of which we don't have a whole lot of control over. What do we have control over and how are we adapting to the need? The demand is increasing every year. I've been in this since 96. And every year, it's a little better. The demand is more and more and more with the steady education. And now the crisis facing us of our climate changing. We have an extinction crisis. People are getting more educated about the connection between plants and animals and the connection between our natural world and ourselves. So the demand is increasing. But it's still it's inconsistent and it's soft. It's not enough to convince big growers, and it's not enough to keep a small grower growing. <laughs> so it's difficult. And again, this is farming. It's, and in South Florida, it's hot farming. <laughs> it's hot, dirty work, and there's all those challenges. But it's all about demand. And I think programs like the Connect to Protect, things like this, all these things have been suggested are good. From a landscape perspective, what we need are excellent examples. We have, um, is it Charlotte, or the, the landscape architect? Carolyn. Carolyn, excuse me, I know it's a C name. Carolyn, a uh, landscape architect on the line. Landscape architects and designers are so important to bring that design perspective. Again, the plants can do everything in the world, but they still need to look good. And of course, there's the full range of aesthetics. Some of us like purple hair and tattoos, and some of us are horrified by purple hair and tattoos. And we have to serve that full market. And taste can change over time, but again, that's hard to control. And as we have more plants on the market, that need for education continues to expand. As the palate expands, the education expands. That's again why FAN concentrates on education for our industry. We have an annual event called the Native Plant Show. This year, I'm so happy that we're moving into Palm Beach County. We've been in other parts of the state. So we're coming into Southeast Florida where we see a huge interest in need. 
and an extra poor supply, perhaps, <laughs> uh, of uh, you know to meet to meet the need and the interest. Um, so if you go to our website, Florida Native Nurseries plural, floridanativenurseries.org. It'll lead you to others, to lead you to the Native Plant Show, it'll lead you to Plant Real Florida, which is a retail outlets uh, information. We want to, to grow with you, um, but it is a difficult industry. It's a difficult industry, and the smaller you are, the more challenging it is, and yet there are also opportunities for the small, tiny operation. So. Okay, Carolyn, you're up next. You probably need that mute. Hi there. Um, so I wanted to talk um, about the perspective of the landscape architect. And Cami, your talk was an awesome precursor because I have experienced all of those challenges that you have talked about from the customer side. But I wanted to talk about the pre-development part of um, creating habitat um, because I think that the the aspect of actually obtaining the plants has is well covered by others so I'm, I'm going to focus on some of the challenges or some of the things that shape the way we are able to do um, habitat creation in urban places and to do that I picked out a project from the past that illustrates a few key points um, one of the um, images that you see on the left is a plan that was developed in 2007, so before the devastating um, housing crisis um, collapse. And that project was conceived as redeveloping a golf course for housing, and that was a, a benefit. Golf courses aren't the most biodiverse places, so um, there was an additional interest in creating a nature scape. So that is the wonderful Broward County program that's implementing Florida's um, Florida friendly landscape uh, concepts. And the project in 2007 had um, 640 dwellings, which in this picture on the left, you can see all the way on the lower left, there's a big apartment building. And by going dense, that allowed a lot of the um, rest of the area to be uh, not covered with buildings. And then the rest of the project was townhouses. And that allowed the whole site plan to include a lot of landscape. And the landscape included uh, stormwater uh, management ponds that were actually set in the center of a, a park that was the main um, attraction in this community that was being planned. And it included uh, clubhouse, tennis courts, swimming pools, pavilions, picnic areas, all sorts of walking paths, playgrounds. So it had a, a big landscape program. And that supported the demand for a lot of plants. And by going with a naturescape program, the concept was that we would be creating some really you know, useful habitat. And the total area of the part of the site that was a, a park was 18 acres. And some of that ability to create you know, a landscape of that scale and with the intent and the um, financing to to um, actually plant it out with, with natives um, comes from some of the regulations that we're working with. And that is the typical land use regulations that um, have changed over time so that they are a bit more habitat friendly, although not perfect. So just the density um, requirement from zoning regulations limits the amount of a, of a patch of land that can be covered with building and inevitably re will result in more pervious area, more area available for planting. Doesn't guarantee that it will be planted in any habitat friendly way, but it does you know, create that possibility. Um, a lot of the land use regulations are devoted to stormwater management, and that includes the Florida Friendly Landscape Program, which has really evolved out of the, 
the stormwater management district's desire to um, reduce water use and reduce um, stormwater pollution. Um, there are also regulations that cover traffic that um, are, are very um, de detailed in the requirements for safety and for also the impact of traffic on community in the surrounding communities. So all of those regulations really shape what development can be. So to the extent that regulations are making it possible to create habitat, it will become a possibility. Um, one of the regulations that is um, specifically about tree canopy replacement um, is an interesting one to think about in terms of, of habitat creation because it can be a, uh, a, an impediment or a um, creator of habitat. So the basic purpose of the tree canopy ordinances that have come up in like the last 15 years all over the country um, is primarily about um, heat island effects. So it's about the canopy, it's about shade, and it's also about stormwater management. And it's, they're not really about habitat creation. Habitat creation is a, a, a side benefit of those. So the ordinances are actually requiring um, for example, inch for inch replacement of tree canopy if a tree is removed um, without regard to the quality of the tree except that it meets certain size requirements. And that is quite a challenge when your intent is to plant or replace um, exotic trees with native trees. It's quite a challenge to be able to um, source the native species in the sizes that are required by these ordinances to accomplish what those ordinances are intended to do, which is to replace that canopy. So those are some of the, the rules of play when you're trying to create some urban habitat. Um, programs like the Broward Naturescape, University of F Florida resources are, you know, incredible benefits for for Florida that aren't really as available in other states. So that's something to be very happy about in Florida, that you have these spectacular resources. And also Fairchild Tropical Garden, um, other you know institutions around South Florida, you, you really have a lot of um, resources there. And, um, and yet you also have the hurricanes. And that, uh, together with the economy, is another, you know, really important driver. And Cami touched on that. And um, the project that you're seeing on the left is the one from 2007, and the one that you're seeing on the right is what happened after the the economic bubble burst. The project um, no longer made any sense as what it was planned as before, which was you know, meeting the density requirements, but also different kind of housing that would be uh, marketable in the, the economy. So it took actually quite a long time for the project, the property owner, to regroup after the, the, the collapse and actually um, redevelop the site. And what we see on the right is what ended up being built on that site. And if you'll notice, all the way on the, on the right-hand side, there are two buildings that are in sort of a parentheses shape. Um, that's where the stormwater pond and most of the open space that was required on the site by the regulations ended up. It's no longer a park with the, the naturescape concept or any of those other landscape amenities that we talked about. And that was because the what made sense economically for the developer uh, was single family homes. So the, the upshot is that the development didn't end up with a, um, a naturescape. It may be that it could in the future because some of the, we'll call it the infrastructure for that to happen is still there. There's still open space. It's still continuous. It, it's still possible to um, imagine that site being developed with a little bit more um, 
nuance or subtlety in, in the planting design than what was possible in the ultimate design. But for that to happen, there really would need to be some kind of um, financial um, support for that. So I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges in actually pulling off a, a habitat creation in a private development project like this is justifying it financially and then um, understanding that there's a significant amount of education that would need to happen with both the developer and the homeowners about the, the benefits and the um, maintenance requirements. Most of the benefits of a nature scape have to do with reducing inputs like irrigation and fertilizers and um, mowing and those kinds of things. So there's there's a case to be made, but there that it it is a case that does have to be made. You know, there's a sales job that has to happen, and part of the role of landscape architects is making that sales job. And one of the things that makes that sales job much easier is um, the availability of the plant material. And so it's a I guess Cami. It's sort of a chicken and, and an egg kind of thing. And there are, um, I know of symbiotic relationships between designers and nurseries where the designer is interested in planting native, so the nurseries understand that this is going to be a demand driver, so they, they, you know, they see if they can make it available. You know, they, and, but that really is about creating a, um, a relationship of, of, um, mutual interest in making that go. So those are just a few thoughts on some of the ways that regulation and, and the, the reality of real estate development challenge us to create habitat. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, next we have Mena. Um, so I'm going to begin the way I like to always begin, is where are we right now? Because I think one of the things that we have to think about when we think about planting, what, what kind of situation, what kind of environment are we in? So this slide right here um, is just showing that um, we are a big county, but most of our county is the Everglades or Miccosukee water conservation lands. So it's not somewhere where we're going to be planting unless we're involved with the National Park Service or things like that. So we, we have a limited space. Um, and this is just, again, to show um, in terms of our density is that uh, when you think about um, our density, when you take the zero population density, uh, Broward County is even denser than Miami-Dade. So not only are we dense, but we have sea level rise. And I think Cami touched on that as well. And so these are all going to be drivers when you're thinking about what you're going to plant. And this is uh, our the salinity line, which is keeps on moving westward and what you're seeing on this slide is our is our wells and why i put this slide in is because that's also going to start driving what we're planting as we get a more saline environment there's two factors the salinity and the ability for the plants to have intermittent inundation so i really truly truly believe that while we start planning for our future and when we're planting thinking about plants that can, can that have higher salt tolerances plants that can have intermittent at least inundation are really more of a sustainable planting regime for us Did it move? Yeah. and this is just a fun video I always show because everybody likes videos and that and this is it's fun, but it's sad, right? So this is the fish in the street, right? But again, this is really, to me, the example of Broward. We are the fish in the street. I see the fish. This is uh, our, our, um, our future conditions, average width, 
seasons map that just came out and the two things that are changing on here is our precipitation um, and the sea level rise. Um, the earlier slide where you saw for 2060 in terms of the sea level rise heights have changed with these maps and these are fresh off the market um, and we have really talented people are in the division so I am by no means saying that this is a nature scape this is a water resources and uh, everybody else in our very talented um, EPCRD division. This is a great green infrastructure series map. We'll send this whole presentation in about at once. Yes. So this is um, from our talented Katie Lelis in conjunction with I see Jill, um, and they this is an award-winning map series, and it's uh, and I think they're going to keep on adding to it as we get more information, um, and you can talk with Jill afterwards um, or contact Katie Lelis. But this is really showing the state of our county, and it's it's really great. Uh, I will put a plug in for us. Kim Mayo is in the audience too from Naturescape. Um, we do do the certifications. We have a very strong partnership with NWF. Um, and part of that is doing the Naturescapes that Carolyn has talked about earlier. So again, this is just a slide showing our Naturescape Broward um, and um, the tenants of it. Um, the picture in the middle are two five-year-olds that helped plant a rain garden at MLK uh, Elementary. So nobody has any excuses. And they were right in there. They had a blast, and so did I. So you're never too young to start. And it took an area that was really an eyesore for an elementary school, and now is something beautiful. Um, some of the solutions that we have on things that people touched about earlier is our habitat connectivity project. That, again, we have uh, with NWF where we have been planting trees throughout the county based upon low canopy. Um, and that has been very successful. I can't remember if we're on our third or fourth year. <coughs> it's a lot of planting. We have a lot of calluses. Um, and we do this in schools. We've been doing it in some parks. Um, and it involves a lot of outreach um, with uh, uh, the community. Um, we also have uh, a very robust outreach program with our pamphlets. I brought some today. And they are award winning. And they deserve it because we work really hard improving them, revamping them. And really, they touch on some of the things, again, that people talked about. Um, you know, people wanting things uh, to be beautiful. They don't think that they can get a Florida native that is as beautiful. Um, we also talk about that in our Naturescape trainings where we, we say, this is an invasive. Here's the native that looks just like it. So plant this. And we also go over some, uh, you know, of the uh, species. I believe that uh, Carolyn talked about earlier in terms of like the porter weed and the fire bush and, and how to distinguish it because it is rampant. Um, our issues with native plants. Um, we, uh, I just recently did the uh, master agreement for our Water Matters Day, and I had a lot of really new plants that we wanted to have and to be seen. Um, and I sent out a uh, request for proposals uh, through our purchasing to over 100 nurseries. We had two of them respond to it. And only one of them met the qualifications. And he only bid on maybe half of the plants. So it was it's a real struggle and it's really a disconnect that I hope that we can solve and and find a way you know to work with the nurseries and figure out was it something that we wrote? Um, is there a different process that we need to go through in order to get the plants that we would like to start giving out to the community at our events and planting? Um, so that's something I think that we can uh, talk about later. This is uh, another uh, collaboration event that just occurred in January where we worked in our Bureau um, um, Broward Municipal Services District, a disadvantaged 
uh, area in our communities with two schools, Dillard High School and Parkway Miller, Miller Middle. And the kids went out and they planted a thousand plants, native plants, the bioswale, moved six cubic yards of gravel, put in um, scientific hobo and data loggers and eye buttons, and got the kids early. That's one of the things I want just to stress is, and I think you've seen it in the pictures, we got to get the kids. I'm tired. I can't plant too many more trees. I can talk about them now, but, you know, and I'm sure Kim can say it too. We're tired. It's hot. So we need to get these kids activated, involved out there. Um, but really start with them and get that ethic right away, because without doing that, we are lost. Um, here are some other partnerships that we have done, one with Eric at the port um, right near the Civic Center. Um, uh, we've done one with Julia, uh, Highway and Bridges. Uh, so really, you can click again. Partnerships mean so much and take the burden and it makes things so much easier to do and uh, the ability to get them uh, done. I think this may be my last slide. These are more partnerships, Lee and Doug, with our dune plantings that we do with our habitat stewards. Uh, training uh, that we do each year with teachers. We'll be doing this next week, um, I think in Hollywood. Um, and then at New River and Middle School, um, our marine uh, section is uh, starting work with a living shoreline in the back of New River Middle School. So we just constantly are trying to find new partnerships, new ideas, and really trying to uh, uh, innovate any way we can. So. Thank you, Mina, and all the presenters. Now, in the notice for the meeting, I uh, proposed a grading system for providing vegetation for native wildlife. This is something I put together. If you hate it, it's my fault. If you like, maybe give a little credit. But let me give you a little bit of background history of where this came from. First of all, the port, one of the reasons we're having this meeting today is I've had significant challenges with landscape architects, not Carolyn, but others, um, landscapers, in trying to plant native vegetation at the port. Uh, we have a policy commitment from our upper management that we're going to optimize habitat value in our green spaces to the maximum extent that we can by planting locally native vegetation. And I try to do that. And landscape architects, unfortunately, keep on pushing non-native vegetation on me. I understand that. Going back a little further, let me explain my background a little bit. I have a master's degree in zoology from the 1980s before they required that zoologists also take classes in botany. I left school without any knowledge of plants whatsoever. Uh, in 1990, I bought my first house. Um, I wasn't working in the environmental field at the time. I went to Fairchild Tropical Gardens, the old Fairchild. I saw these beautiful plants. Um, going to home improvement stores, every time I'd get a bunch of lumber, I'd grab something that I saw that looked pretty. I was very much a uh, horticulturalist. And I was very proud of everything I had planted in my yard until 1992 when I started working for Dade County Durham. And then I realized that what I was doing was really supporting wildlife. And it changed my perspective completely. I got rid of all my non-natives and planted native. And I've been, since then, only planting locally native vegetation. And But I saw the transition in myself from going from a ornamental ornamental horticulturist to someone that was trying to do something additional. And if somebody had approached me when I first planted my house and say, you're doing it all wrong, I probably would have been resistant to somebody telling me what to do on my own property. So what um, I devised this grading system to try and convey to the landscape architects, to our upper management, to other entities that are trying to push non-natives on us in terms of why we're trying to do it. And I don't want to put anybody on the defensive to say it's absolutely wrong, but by saying that by doing these additional steps, you can really do something positive for the environment, I can say, let's try to get that A+. Plus. And I think that that's a good tool for me, hopefully for others, to try to convey the message of the importance of planting locally native vegetation. So this is kind of a draft form. I, there was one comment that I didn't get implemented in here in the D range. But I'm looking for feedback from you guys. So if you have feedback about this grading system, if you think I should actually dump it for some reason, let me know. If you think it's useful and you have some feedback, please let me know. But this already is a tool that I'm using at the port to try and convey this message to others. So that's what I started with. But we also have a lot of next steps. When I look at everybody in the audience, and I recognize half of you through 
other environmental programs. A very diverse group here. Not everybody's from SFAP. I see people that I don't recognize with um, native vegetation shirts on. Thank you. Yeah. So I know that I'm kind of preaching to the choir. What we need to do is get the message out to the ornamental horticulturists that there's more to just planting pretty plants in Broward County where we only have 3% of our remaining of our original natural area remaining in the upland areas. You know, we can make a difference in the vegetation that's planting in the planted in the developable, developed areas. We can create um, wildlife corridors for different species. We can offset some of the impacts that we've seen. I also wanted to mention, um, you know, we have stories, success stories, like the Atella butterfly was once not known in South, in Florida at all. And then we started planting the Kunti all over the place. And Kunti, you know, I don't, kind of reluctant to give the home improvement stores credit, but Home Depot and other home improvement stores were selling Kunti like crazy at one time. And in 2015, uh, when Broward County did their butterfly count, uh, I believe the Tella was number one species. I mean, it fluctuates a lot, but we, uh, by planting that larval host plant, we made a difference in the Tella butterfly. Um, there are other examples with butterflies, and uh, Sandy, I know, is a butterfly expert, so she can correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the species, like the Miami blue butterfly, it's now on the endangered species list. And it's, I don't think for any other reason than loss of its larval host plant, the gray knicker bean. Um, gray knicker bean used to occur all the way up the coast to, I think, any river county. Brevard. Brevard County, okay. And uh, we, for some reason, it's not vouchered in Broward County, so we have that gap. But there are records of the Italo butterfly occurring in northern Dade County, possibly Broward County. And now it's restricted to, um, I think, just... Uh, yeah, but, Miami Blue, you're talking about. Yeah, maybe it's uh, down in the key somewhere. I forget. Um, it's offshore. It's in the Marquesas. Yeah. It's the only place. And it's just purely, from what I understand, oh, loss yeah. of that gray knicker bean. And it's not that aesthetically pleasing of a plant, but that's an example of something if we had planted more of, we might have not that loss of that species. Same with the um, Bertram Seer Street butterfly with the Pineland Proton. And... Uh, but we also have examples of where non-native vegetation is adverse. And there's an article that was put out by the Smithsonian about how the non-native tropical milkweed um, causes problems with the digestive tract of the monarch butterfly. It's a little complex, but I want to start collecting these examples. And with SFAP, we have a, a page dedicated to the importance of native vegetation for native wildlife. So if you know examples that we can provide of where um, a specific species of plants or the loss of those plants is resulting in the loss of wildlife or examples of where when we inter when we not introduce but replace species that are had been lost we see successes like the tele butterfly I think those messages are also very important in reaching out to the um, horticultural community that these are things we can do to make significant improvements so let me see where we are in time um, we got about three minutes um, I just want to mention something else um, regarding uh, vegetation. Um, I used to be a, a instructor and also on the board of governors for the um, Florida Master Naturalist Program, and so we taught a lot of wildlife classes, and we also set up a citizen scientist bat study project where we were looking at the occupation of man-made structures statewide. And there were some interesting things that I found before I turned the project over to someone else. But, for example, the um, Brazilian free-tailed bat is found throughout Florida, except for Broward, Dade, and Monroe, uh, the Keys part of Monroe County. And I was going to do a geographic uh, GIS analysis to try and figure out what variables there were that uh, might restrict the range, because it's not temperature, because they um, fl fly south throughout um, down to Brazil. Um, I couldn't find any other common variable, but it could be that there is some association needed with some plant that is available here. You know, we have so much to learn about our wildlife and the interactions with the vegetation that uh, before it's too late, we should be pushing to try and provide the habitat that they need, the species that they need before we have extreme losses. So. Um, I know we're kind of short on time. I don't want to let this go too long, but I would like to, on the SFAP website, list the steps that would be good to 
really make this message worthwhile, to really convey to the ornamental, ornamental horticulturists that there are opportunities to do more. You can still have landscapes that are aesthetically pleasing and provide habitat for wildlife, support local wildlife within those plantings. So we want to help create a market for lo uh, local native nurseries. Um, you know, we can use this grading system, uh, or anybody can use this grading system. Uh, we can use this discussion from today's forum. Uh, the uh, webcast will be available. Um, we have different websites like the um, um, the Institute for Regional uh, Conservation. Did I get that right? Okay. They have some excellent resources that Richard mentioned. Make those available to people you're trying to convey the message to. And um, get volunteers to meet. Uh, and give presentations to some groups. We have a lot of very diverse types of plant groups in South Florida. Uh, there is even one that promotes the planting and distribution of exotic species. So, yeah, it, it's unfortunate, but people, they get attracted to certain things. And there isn't anything wrong with that, um, unless they're, of course, spreading, you know, class two and class one um, species. But we want to get the message out to them, maybe have the the um, epiphany moment that I had when I started at Durham realizing that I was doing something wrong and that it can be done better. So all of you in this room have the opportunity to reach out and make those connections with these groups, with the um, uh, Master Gardener program, with um, all these specific plant community, uh, plant societies, um, et cetera. And also reach out to your local government. Uh, elected officials, the engineering, planning, like landscape review staff. Um, I've even had situations where the landscape reviewers are trying to encourage me to plant non-native species instead of native. So uh, those are all opportunities we have. Um, and it is now 1.15, which is when I wanted to close the meeting. Um, so if anybody needs to go for other purposes, um, please don't feel intimidated about leaving. But what I'd like to do is open it up for some additional discussion. We'll leave the recording on. I'll also open the floor to people that are on the webinar. And uh, we can answer questions and discuss things internally for another 15 minutes or so. And then conclude the recording and we'll capture that for everybody to use. So let me first turn off the, um, the mute for everybody. And if you're on the phone and want to speak, um, please set your mute now if you have background noise, and then unmute if you want to say something. So, where is the unmute call? And if you're leaving, thank you very much for joining us. Very much appreciated. Oh, the audience is already. Oh, I want to unmute. No, they are unmuted. Okay, so if you're in the audience, you can unmute yourself and then speak. But we have a few people that wanted to uh, ask questions, like Doug. Yeah, and what I wanted to do is just tell you, I'm going to send you some links. I actually have material in the car, and I can't believe I didn't bring it in to pass out to National Audubon, Audubon, Florida, and all the chapters, 45 Audubon chapters in Florida. There's a program that's funded by Audubon, Florida, through the foundation called Plants for Birds. So what it's all about, when I give you the links on the website, it's, it's all about native plants using zip codes throughout the country to attract birds so that appropriate native plants can be planted. So it, it all ties in. So I gotta, I'll send you the link so you can pass it. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we'll include that as well. Does anyone else in the, have in the, in the audience here? Um, have any points of questions or discussion? Yeah. So um, speaking to our landscape people, both the planners and our, our nursery people, uh, Richard, you know, you mentioned that we're kind of preaching to the choir here. One of the biggest problems that I see is landscaping practices that are done by those guys that you know they have the all the, the tractors and the the clips and everything like I left my apartment complex this morning and I look in the trash and there's uh, I was throwing out my own trash that's why I was doing that um, and and all these the clips from the palm trees the flower they're not they cut the flowers off and cut the, the uh, we talk about the bats the bats lose those fronds as the the, the, uh, the leaves are down. 
and, and so the landscaping practices, this is not this kaya. If we want wildlife, we have to allow leaf litter. We have butterflies that the larvae live in the leaf litter. We have, how many of you have seen um, uh, uh, lightning bugs lately? Right. Okay, they live in the leaf litter. So we, plug, we take everything, we throw it in a plastic bag, we throw it in the trash. Uh, they cut off all the vegetation that the animals can eat. The only way, yeah. Them? The only way for that to happen, though, really, they are doing what they perceive to be the desire of the customer. So, ultimately, the public has to rise up and demand no, no, no. And it, it is a long. I have been screaming about sable palm pruning for 25 years, and in my own town. And I, I'm, I, you know, I'm like the crazy erratic old woman now coming to the city council. <laughs> You know, saying, you told me you had a no-prune policy and you just pruned, you know, that, all that. All so out. it's a constant, persistent, you know, it's not a one and done. This is an this is you devote your life to this and you hope the next generation continues it. Um, but, you know, we, we joke about South Florida. I'm in Central Florida. I mean, we, we joke about this. I, I actually got this... Um, phrase from a designer, a young man, so it's great because he's young and he'll probably do other stuff. Um, and I think he's in, maybe based in Palm Beach County and he said, oh yeah, he said, it's the tyranny of the triple layer hedge. And you all really, I mean, South Florida really <laughs> developed that. You know what I'm talking about, the hedge, you know? But we need to get people to intensely dislike that and say, I don't want that, I want this other. Sometimes a triple layer hedge may be okay. It's amazing what can live in a really densely, you know, hedged up thing. But it's all about the public saying no and really loudly saying no. I mean, they don't want to have to do that. I mean, okay, people who are not educated, thats and that's part of what's on the industry. And, and I have some industry people here. What's on the industry is we have to educate our own people to do better. And that's starting to happen. There's a, across the whole culture industry, whether it's native or not, there's an emphasis on professionalizing the workforce and education and training and learning that, you know, get the hammer, everything's a nail or whatever, all, you know, doing better. But the demand has to, it's all about demand. It's all about demand. So we have to keep educating those things about what lives in the leaf letter and the fact that you just killed 9,000 things with your blower or whatever. I had know. somebody one time when I worked over here, uh, literally a, a bag of atalopupids I just killed about 10,000 of these because they were all over my plants. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. So I, I have a point I want to make. And Mina kind of touched on a little bit about climate change. Um, as a member of the Climate Change Task Force, there was an interesting presentation made several months ago about the effects of climate change on our water resources and how salt water retrusion is going to negatively, negatively affect our wells. Um, and what I found very interesting is that the county still doesn't mandate native species being planted in these large scale projects. They're still allowing non native species to be planted. And of course, there's conservation measures that have been in effect for many year, years, which people don't abide by anymore, they're watering lawns on a continuous basis. I think it's time the county mandates that all future projects are planted with native species to further reduce the demand of a pot of water, which by the way, 50% of our pot of water goes to irrigation in the state of Florida. So to me, it would seem logical that the county needs to mandate future projects should be native species. You know, it's, it's important that we plant uh, species for habitat, but what it comes down to again is money. Money is what rules, and if people have to pay two times, three times, four times the amount of money for the water. Ultimately, they're going to start cut, cutting back the water. But what are they going to do about landscaping? Well, the landscaping is what's really drawing our water resources down. And if the county mandates that we start to change those parameters and mandate that we put native species in that don't have the same water requirements as lawns and non-native species, I think it needs to come from the head down. Because until that happens, until it, people pay, pay, they're not going to make changes. They're going to want beautiful things. And if it costs too much money to have those beautiful things, then people are going to start evaluating some 
let's look at some native species that don't require the water resources that we're putting in the high <coughs> I think dealing with politicians is challenging because, you know, they they want to represent their um, constituents. constituents, right? And if they perceive that there's you know regulation that's going to be uh, ill received, you know, telling people what they can and cannot do on their property, especially a lot of people are very passionate about their plants, especially when they find focus on one group of plants like palms or. Uh, bromeliads or something, uh, they don't really want somebody to tell them that they're what they're doing isn't right. So there, there are challenges, and a lot of us in this room work for government. I can't go and um, go to the politicians and promote change. It was really the public, you guys that aren't in the public sector, that need to band together, that need to find a way to connect with the um, elected officials to encourage them to start proposing legislation that will gradually make those changes. I think it's hard to make drastic changes at one time, but maybe an implementation policy saying, you know, we're going to start uh, in the next five years, we're going to maybe start requiring 25% of all landscaping that's planted being native. We probably already have something like that in some municipalities, but it's... Um... Hi, Eric. This this is Carol, and I just wanted to, to follow up on that thought. Um, there are requirements for native plants in many, if not most, landscape ordinances, um, and yet it's still hard to. Well, and their their percentage is like forty percent, so it's not um, where we might like it to be. But that availability of the native plant material is really the the biggest challenge, and. Regulators aren't going to require all native plants if they simply aren't out there because it will be unachievable. But public sector clients can, because you have the ability to plan further in advance for a big project, you can do the contract growing, which I think is one of the most important tools that the community has to support local natives. Um, no small business or even large business is going to grow things where, where they're not guaranteed a, a sale. And when we have a big project where we have the, you know, the appropriate planning timeline, we can go ahead and identify what the plants that are needed are going to be and then create the contract with the grower to supply them. So they're not speculating on whether someone is going to block, buy their natives. They have a, a solid government contract to grow this stuff. And I think that's a big if that became more common with um, public projects, it would really support the native plant industry and you know get the ball rolling a bit more. And I think there's some challenges with your procurement processes where that's often not possible. So just a couple of thoughts on how to, how to make that um, work. Okay. Kim, did you want to? Yeah, I have to say something too about water conservation.
at their language. That's not going to happen either. And it results in a lot of public backlash from an education. It's never going to happen. You have to change people's values through education. Well, when I was a kid, it was always a paper. It was a paper. What section you were in, what day you could water, what time you could water, and Right, exactly. Linda, did you want to say something about the contract um, uh, plant uh, uh, growing? We have not used, um, I'm, I'm from Broward County Parks, we haven't used contract growing yet. It's not a direction that I'd like to go in the future, but we're still trying to contract out some of our um, management efforts, like exotic plant like removal and control. So that's one that we're working on right now, but in the future I'd like to do an agreement with um, one or many uh, nurseries so that we plan what we'd like to buy, tell them what we're committing to buy, and then even possibly work out if it's an agreement with specific nurseries. I can see that you could have a relationship where they collect seeds under you know a great amount of seeds, a great amount of plant tissue, and then they can then cultivate that for um, restoration purposes and landscaping, and perhaps even you know, it have to be part of the agreement or perhaps even sell part of that to the public as well. Um, but you can't just open up our natural areas to be harvested because then then we'll be in trouble in the natural areas. If, if um, anybody can come in and just start collecting, you're not supposed to collect the natural areas. Um, I think it would be better if you could have a partnership with a... Um, yeah, like with a fair child. Well, we do actually. for the <laughs> for the for the seed collection, and then if you could provide seed that the provenance and identity was absolute, we are customers. Right. Like well, we're not able to sell it yet, but we are working yeah. with fair child. They're coming into the parks and they're um, going through and trying to find the rarest plants that we have not been certain are still being preserved in the areas, and some of those plants. If there's enough tissue available, seeds available, they are trying to take that and cultivate it um, so that we can plant it. So, yeah. but that's a very small scale because there's yeah. basically one biologist that we've contracted for five years. <laughs> 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 Workforce production, more biologists. I just want to say for us, we have thought about that, that but through our purchasing, it, it's not something that they think that we were able to do. I don't know. Hopefully, in the future, it would have to be an agreement. It would be purchasing. It would have to be like an agreement with an institution or through an institution, perhaps. Uh, Jill, you had your hand up earlier. I did. I wanted to ask Carolyn something if she's still. Carolyn, can okay. you hear? Carolyn? She muted. She might be muted. Yes, it was regarding the uh, golf course example that she gave between 2007 and 2015 about what had been planned as far as nature scape and what actually happened after the crash. And um, since I do land these reviews sometimes for the county, I'm interested in the topic and um, in the way regulation works and sometimes doesn't work. And I'm wondering if she had any suggestions that she comes back on later could respond about what could have been done in that situation, whether. Um, the land use amendment that was proposed was just too vague because it was transferring from the golf course so that single family use was still additional density and qualify. Why Why was that uh, mixed use, high density um, proposal not, not the minimum? Um, is it an impervious, impervious percentage that needs to go up? What, what is it that we don't lose those opportunities? Because I know it's really hard to convince somebody that's already planting, that already loves their garden, the way that they have it, to change. But when we have new people coming in and providing that environment for them, why not from the get-go give them what we expect uh, South Florida to be uh, or to become again? So um, what are the opportunities in land use and regulation to make sure that we don't lose those opportunities again? Uh, like Carolyn, are you on the phone still? Or the webinar? Uh, yeah, I am, but I, I didn't quite hear the the whole question. It's a long one. The impervious percentage that we could have raised? It was it um, the density, the housing? What, what could we have done to have not lost that opportunity? Well, so part of that formula was that the um, and I only know about the what was publicly presented because all of these plans need to be approved by the planning board. So one thing that can happen is having people show up and say, wait a minute, what about the landscape ordinance that requires 40% um, native plants? 
you know, and really, you know, doing some advocacy that way. In terms of the regulations, the I, I know the Fort Lauderdale um, landscape regulation um, was recently updated. Um, Hollywood's hasn't been updated lately, and just having a look at the landscape ordinance and seeing where it's asking for native plants and what the percentage is, and then um, actually making the plan reviewers understand that there is a constituency out there that cares about it, and they will show up at public hearings and ask if those requirements are being met. In reference to um, Carolyn's notation about regulation, replacing trees that even may be tall, exotic trees that provide canopy, but uh, we must, in, in Broward, replace them with 10-foot trees that, and we cannot even replace them with maybe the same amount of square foot canopy and native growth, because it, it has Well, to so be that's, a you're making an exit. That's an excellent point because that's not the way that ordinance is written. That ordinance is written that you're to replace um, by a formula, which is pretty typical, but it's enforced with an inch per inch caliper replacement. So all of those landscape ordinance could have a a refresh that that is a is tilted more toward habitat. So if the intent of the regulation is to preserve the, the tree canopy, and there's some method, you know, to, to comply with it by offering the same amount of canopy and In brush, with, with, with a variety of sizes right. of plants. Yes, then instead of 10-foot trees. 12-foot trees, 2-inch yes. um, diameter at breast height. That's how out of date the Hollywood regulation is. So Fort Lauderdale has actually gone to caliper. But yeah, so looking at those, um, the landscape ordinances and the tree canopy replacement ordinances and seeing where they could be revised, that's something that you know a group could take to their um, city council and say, what about you know looking at this again? It's my understanding that the City of Hollywood landscape ordinance is currently um, under revision, so there might be opportunities if you live in the City of Hollywood to make comments like that to the commissioners. And there are challenges, like at the board, um, we're in three municipalities, and we recently, uh, with Carolyn's help, um, we removed some non-native trees and we're trying to replace them with um, assemblages of native plants, kind of mimicking habitat uh, communities. And um, we got hit with this two-inch DBH, 12-foot tree constraint that eliminated some of the natives that just, they don't grow that robust. We did get a concession on uh, satin leaf. Satin leaf wasn't really available in two-inch, but we can get 1.5-inch. They, after a lot of back and forth, they're allowing us to plant the 1.5-inch and get credit for them toward a total caliper replacement requirement. And again, this is for taking out non-native trees, uh, something that we're trying to do for the betterment of, you know, wildlife. We're in the middle of three parks. We have um, State Park on our east, and we have um, on our south and to our west, we have uh, Westlake Park. And we have, we're a major uh, tr trans corridor for wildlife, and we're trying to optimize habitat value. And we get hit with all these horticultural uh, perspectives and what we should look like, and it's a challenge, and hence we're here. To add to that challenge is the culture in Tallahassee would like to remove a lot of these local guidelines and local ordinances, and so that adds a different, you know, different layer to the mix. We may feel one way here in South Florida, but we may be fighting a different perspective coming from, from Tallahassee. I know that the tree ordinance, the countywide tree ordinance, has gotten weakened um, recently by a bill signed by the governor that will um, allow you, if you have a, a, a tree on your land and you think it's dangerous, you have an arborist say, if it's your private home, you say an arborist says it, it can come out, it can come out. It doesn't have to go through the um, mitigation at all. It's interesting. Trees. So, so that adds a whole other layer. I mean, we may feel like we need stronger, we need updated, but we're getting a different climate coming you know, from, from above, even the local level. I think South Florida should succeed. 
Well, but there are a lot of engineers in South Florida. We're Caribbean. We are Caribbean. We are not Central and North Florida. Yes. That's the bottom line. Mena. 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 so envious there's a collegiate plant initiative thing where they do these fabulous plant drop programs on college campuses to get kids exposed to plants and interested in plants and growers donate like thousands of you know plants I'm not real interested in but anyway they're plants I would love to be able to do something like that Probably not in my lifetime. This is a great suggestion. Miami Dade County has contracted with some of the local homeowners who have certain plants like Torchwood for the shell swallowtail. And those homeowners are supplying the seeds for their plants in their gardens, that's their good. trees. And that's a suggestion. People who have naturescape homes. Have them donate some of their seeds. Yeah, I think that if there's a will, there's a way, and there's. Yeah, if you need help, absolutely. Because I've been meeting with the school board. That's how we got. It's actually part of the curriculum. Um, we certified them. Yes, we didn't deal with teachers in the school. At the Water Matters Day South Plantation Horticultural Program, they had one of the largest booths there. They had two booths, and I looked at what they were working with, and I didn't see a single native in there. No, that's yeah. why I was wondering. I don't have to go around. 
So we go and we also, you know, part of our program is planting the gardens. We were the first school district in the county because of our part, the Commissioner's Key Partnership, and then they put in the gardens. We put trees, part of the habitat connectivity, and lots of projects that we do um, are putting the trees into the schools and working with the schools and doing environmental curriculum, not only for the kids, you know, over 50,000 kids have had high school career elementary have been educated um, on native plants. Um, we do it with the teachers, probably 500 teachers, more than that, custodial um, custodians as well, because really without them, nothing's going to exist on your notes. But, you know, let's talk afterwards and see if there's something that's to really kind of get it going. I know Victor, too, is you know, really invested in and getting that and figuring out a way. It always becomes down to Money. This is Carolyn. Can I can I just make one one more or just pass on one more thought? Um, or it's actually a concept, and I think it's helpful in you know building an industry. Um, in the design world, there's something called a volume specifier, and a volume specifier is some designer or builder or other entity that can be relied on to specify a lot of something. And those volume specifiers get a lot more attention from salespeople and, and suppliers because they're just a better customer, more reliable. So identifying and making those relationships um, with volume specifiers and then some a brokerage or some kind of a supply clearing house or other kind of service that would allow the collectively the Florida native plant industry to to fulfill the, those you know demands I think would be helpful um, because one of the things to keep in mind is that e even with the best intent if you can't fulfill the um, you know, the planting plan that you've put together, and Eric and I just went through this, if you can't fulfill the planting, you know, intent because the plants aren't out there, it's embarrassing. And often um, designers or specifiers aren't just aren't going to do it um, because it's just too risky and too hard to, to pull off. So things that facilitate the... Um, the supply and demand relationship can be very helpful, and I have to think it's going to come through identifying those those volume specifiers, and but also maybe through the Native Nursery Association, some kind of a um, clearinghouse or something that would help those specifiers actually source plants more easily and and more reliably. I think that working with the kids is so extremely important because especially the high school kids, they're ready to get out and if they're studying horticulture and they want to advance into that career, they're, that's really the time to... They're also getting a science credit, so they're just classes are not with It doesn't matter, those kids are still young. And I'd like to see more native plants and what they're working with. And don't, don't want to take anything away from the Florida native nurseries, but there might opportunities, might be opportunities to do contract growing with some of the high schools. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So we would like we need the next generation. So we'd be very in favor of that. <laughs> My son's going to the environmental program in South Atlanta next year, and I'm oh, okay. hoping that he can do some of these things. We're trying to get <laughs> going to grass. I'm sorry, South, no, South Plantation. Okay. Okay. The South Plantation is the Disney Everglades. Yes, Everglades. Okay, I was going to say that's what I'm working with. Yes. Okay. With the Florida Native Plant Association, 
like nature scape with the kids and children involved. You're always saying, you're saying, oh, you wanted young children involved. I have two young children at home who are willing to help. <laughs> they love getting dirty, playing with the dirt and the soil. So <laughs> I, I started with little like raised beds and we had a house and now they enjoy helping me with containers, container garden, but I can volunteer with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to come with them because we know. <laughs> Thank you for raising children that like dirt. <laughs> Well, we're half an hour over when we intended to end. Um, if you have any additional comments, like I mentioned, SFAP is going to put this up on our website, um, all the next steps. If you have additional next steps that I'm not able to extract from the audio, uh, please send them to me. We'll populate it with that. But I'm also encouraging anybody else that has websites, social media, any other way of getting this message out to the public to also convey the message. This audio recording, you're welcome to put it up on your website. All the information we have, you know, we're really, we don't want to take ownership of it. We just want to make it as available as possible to anybody who has an interest. You want to give that website again? Uh, it's uh, sfaep.org. It's, um, it's so I'm going to stop the recording now. I appreciate everybody that's still online for sticking with us, and all of you for sticking with us as well. I think. Thank we you, Eric. And thank you, Pamela. I think we made a good first step. I mean, not a first step, but a good additional step in the right direction today. Thank you all. Are you still on Twitter? Uh, we don't have a lot of Twitter activity. Because I saw the meeting on Facebook.